And it is my great honor, my great privilege to introduce to you our founder, our chief visionary officer, who is going to take us not just into the past, but as a visionary officer, he's taking us into, into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Victor Klare. Thank you, Peter Paul. Thank you for your introduction. Um, you know, 21 years ago, I wrote this document in my little apartment, writing down my dreams, how software development should have done, should be done. But no way I would thought at the time that I would stand for such an audience, the ThinkWash community, who all, all, all uses this idea. It's really un unbelievable. So. <laughs> and in, in this presentation, I want to go back to the start of ThinkWise to share you my dreams, how we started, but also uh, to share with you uh, what my dreams are for the next maybe five to seven years. And those are not um, building thousands and thousands of apps on top of core application. That is definitely not my dream. So I'll, I will share you where I think we're going. Um, but let's go to, back to the start of ThinkWise, or even my career. Um, I started as a consultant, um, and my job was to select the right ERP solution for our clients. And I did it a couple of times, but we never did the implementation, so I never saw the result of my, of my work. And I also missed being a programmer. So after one year, I thought, you know, I know the market pretty well. I have advised a couple of vendors. I'm going to join one of these software vendors. And, and so I did. And after a few weeks, I was completely in shock because I found out that the software I advised to a company didn't work. Didn't work at all. I'd seen all the commercial demos, and it didn't work. And more importantly, they had written the software for a DOS environment, and they couldn't migrate to Windows. It was impossible. And that problem intrigued me a lot, because I hadn't learned at university how to migrate software from one programming language to another. I was taught that I would program Pascal the rest of my life. And Pascal was over before my career started. So that was, really, that was really something that intrigued me. And after a couple of years, I was asked to join another ERP vendor, and I was basically the first employee. So I became responsible for building a very, very large application. In that company, we built a larger, larger application than any application at ThinkWise. We built our own development environment, and we even called it the software factory at the company. And I especially say we, because I did it together with Roland van Achele, Frank Wijnhout, René Jochem, uh, colleagues from ThinkWise, but I know these guys for 26 years. So they all have the experience of building such a large application. And after six years, I came in a situation to, to think about my future, and I, I wrote that book. And that book was about building very large applications which you could easily change and with, which become never technologically outdated. But it was focused on the building process, not on the complete software life, life cycle as we know it today in our platform. So we add, have added a lot, a lot of things. So, sorry. Um, so th th that was the, uh, the book we, we wrote and the ideas we had to start ThinkWise. But if you had shown me our platform today, in 2002, then I wouldn't believe that that was possible. Unbelievable. So my team basically exceeded the expectations of my dreams. So how cool is that? My team exceeded the expectations of my dream. That's really unbelievable. But then, back to the reality of our prospects. I mean, our prospects suffer from legacy. There's a lot of legacy software in the world. Um, but the legacy software of today has been written 20 years ago by programmers who just used the most modern programming languages of their time. 
but today we have far more programmers than 20 years ago, and they're also more productive. So imagine how big the legacy problem will be in five years or 10 years. The legacy problem will become bigger every year. And that's a huge challenge. So what's the agenda for this presentation? I would like to dive a bit deeper into that, 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 that legacy challenge that we have as a business. Then I would like to introduce the ThinkWise concept on a high level, briefly. And then we make a time, jump in time, five years, and look back on what low code has brought us and what the role of ThinkWise is in it. So what is legacy software? Legacy software is basically software that is technologically outdated. Sometimes the functionality is not that good as well. Sometimes, most often, functionality is quite good or even brilliant. But all the, time, all the cases, technology is, or uh, the software is technologically outdated. And it has a certain impact on your business. First of all, there will be a brain drain. It's very hard to hire developers, but it's much harder to hire developers who want to work in COBOL or RPG. And your, 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 your developers will probably leave if you work with legacy software. Um, so the brain drain will affect your company. And it's very hard to, to maintain your software. I mean, we know situations that clients have to increase their client number, their client identification, from six to eight characters, because they had over one million clients. So it's very cool. You have a lot of clients, only we cannot register them in our software. So there was a small change request, increase that field from six to eight characters. But not only in the core, also in all the applications around it. It was estimated that it would take three man years to do this, to this, uh, to this uh, adjustment, to make this adjustment. So when you spend three years on maintenance, you cannot spend it on innovation. And if you cannot change, then you become susceptible to, dis to disruption. And you can certainly not be the disruptor yourself, because you cannot change. You have all kinds of security risks, so altogether, your business continuity will become more and more in danger. That's the effect of legacy software. And it's probably bigger than you think. So if you ask a CEO to solve this, then he or she will probably say, OK, just buy off-the-shelf off -shelf solution, because then we're fine, and then it's responsible of the software vendor to migrate to new technology. And I think that's true, in theory, because they don't. I mean, SAP migrated from R3 to HANA. It took them 30 years, and they have all the money of the world. HANA doesn't cover all the functionality of R3, and your custom software will not be migrated. So that's tough. And implementing SAP itself is already tough. Look at these examples. The project team at Lidl, I'm, I'm sure that that was a project team with very, far, very smart people. But they spent 500 million euros without any result. And the last part, if you buy off-the-shelf solution, keep it standard. I think nine out of 10 implementations start with the idea that we only implement the standard functionality and we have no custom software. When you look back, I think nine out of 10 will have customization and you cannot uh, migrate them to the new technologies. So what's the role of low code in this? And for that, I use the, the page layered application strategy model of Gartner. And Gartner tells us to describe your application landscape in three layers. Three layers with a different pace. And at the core, at the bottom, you have the system of records. In the system of record, there's your core application. Strategic application, business critical, uh, very, very large, and has to last for decades. And your core application can be implemented as SAP, but can also be written in COBOL, RPG, or any other language. The pace of change of such core applications is slow. And your business probably won't accept it, so they start to, to buy applications around it, or even 
build it around it with Excel and Access. Because every department has some technical guy and they can build some applications. A couple of years ago, I was at a German pump manufacturer. They had over 10,000 employees. German company, of course, had SAP. And we were asked to look at a couple of applications around SAP. We showed, we, we showed them our concept, what we could do, and we also showed them the way we can upcycle, we can modernize one of those, these applications. So after one week, they sent us the application of their choice that we could upcycle. And believe it or not, but they sent us the application in which they registered all the applications they had around SAP. <laughs> With all the interface and everything. So in that application were 700 applications, 200 already deactivated, 500 active. That was their application landscape. So what I learned is that you need at least 500 applications to work with SAP properly. <laughs> and I think that the, the, the no-code vendors and the low-code vendors jumped into that area to build these apps on top of a core application faster, more productively, together with the business, all, all good things, all advantages. But if you give the no-code and a low-code platform to, such, to, to that pump manufacturer, what will be the result? 1,000 applications? 5,000 applications? Is that manageable? So no-code vendors are Betty Blocks or QuickBase, often bought by the business themselves, and, and, and they can also build themselves. Uh, low code is uh, Mendex, out systems, and always uh, uh, and they work together with and IT and the business work together. But Thinkwise started in 2002. And at that time, there were no smartphones, there were no apps. Our focus always has been to replace the core. Do we have to do everything? Um, no. I mean, your accounting software, your HR, your salary system, please buy that. You just have to follow the law. Creativity is not really something our government like. So you, you can just buy the, the off-the-shelf solutions. At the top, um, business-to-consumer apps depends a bit on your requirements. Sometimes we can do it. Sometimes you can better do it with other no-code or, or low-code systems. So we built basically a flexible core, and there might be some apps around it. 10, 20, 30 is OK, but not 5,000. So we all try to solve the same problem. Namely, the core that's very inflexible, the core you cannot change, but we do it in a complete different manner. Or you put apps on top of it, or you replace the problem itself. But the low-code and no-code platforms cannot migrate from one technology to another. So is building up technological depth inevitable? No, because that is why we started this company. That's really a big difference. And we had to because our focus always has been those, those, those very large core applications. And if they should last for, for, for decades, then you have to be able to migrate to new technology. So what's the thing by concept on a high level? What you see here is a timeline from past to future. And below the line is a traditional approach. And of course, programmers choose the most modern programming language to build their application. And of course, they can change and extend the application. But you cannot always use all the new technologies. I mean, if you have, a, if you have built a character-oriented uh, program, you cannot migrate to Windows. If you have built a, a fat, client, fat Windows client, you cannot migrate to the web. So there are always some limitations. And at a certain point in time, sometimes after 10 years, sometimes after 30 years, you have to replace your application and you're going to rebuild it. But your legacy software, from a functional point of view, was probably not bad at all. So you're going to rebuild 100%, and 80% will be more or less the same. So you gain only a 20%. So there's a really, really bad business case. You build 100% to gain a 20%. And worst of all, it didn't solve your problem, because this will become outdated as well only faster, because technologies are enter the market faster and faster than it used to be. So this problem is getting bigger and bigger. 
So what's the ThinkWise approach? Our, our solutions always contain two parts, two components, you could say. One is the model, and the model is customer-specific. The model is a container word for data model, UI model, and business rules, but also requirements model, test model. Everything you need to describe an application is put in a model. You can define it in a graphical way, and you store it in a database. But the model isn't software yet. So we add the software. 20 years ago, we wrote that in Visual Basic. We wrote it in high code. It's not generated. It's high, it's, 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 it's high code, compiled. Um, in an abstract manner, it doesn't know really anything, but when you start that piece of software, it asks, where is my model, and it starts behaving according to the model. Where is my menu? What objects do I have? What color should I use? So everything is model-driven. So every customer has its own unique model, and all these customers have the same, what we call, technology plug. But of course, Visual Basic is outdated, so we rewrite the technology plug in C-sharp. That's our responsibility. We did it in a two-tier, and later on in a three-tier. So we can't only migrate from one programming language to another, but also from one architecture to another. We did it for the web technology. Also different technologies. And if you think legacy is always 20 or 30 years old, then I would like to introduce you to Silverlight, because that is legacy of seven-year-olds. We have had prospects with over 100 man years development and went never live, went never onto, into the market with a Silverlight uh, application. We are responsible for all the, all the different behaviors of all the, the web browsers. Ask a developer how tough that can be. Um, and we, are, we have our technology plugs for the mobile devices. And most importantly, we are responsible for your techno technical future. And our latest version is our universe UI written in React, which has also been shown today. So our customers, they maintain their functionality through the model. They're busy with their business, and they're optimizing the model. And we provide them new technologies so the technology never becomes outdated. So with ThinkWise, you basically do your last IT project. There is no need to replace it. But if you're still here, that's something where we've thought of. We can derive metadata from this system. We call it upcycling, modernizing, upcycling. Sounds better than recycling, right? Um, and we can make a first version of this model. And we can do this very, very well. I mean, we, we do this a lot in proof of values in the sales cycle. And imagine there's an RPG environment, character-oriented. We do the upcycle. We need probably three weeks. And then you have your, your database in Azure, uh, fully loaded with your data. You have a React user interface, which run on, runs on any, on any device. Authorization is there until field level. User preference is there, so users can adjust their screens. It's all available. When we show this to a CEO, then he thinks, OK, great, one more week and we're ready to go. And then we have to manage the expectations a bit, <laughs> um, because we have to add some business rules. So this will take probably a couple of hundred days, but not a couple of thousand days. So we, of course, we're 10 times faster, um, but we, we can really show what we are capable of. <coughs> so what are these screens, how these the screens look like in the past? I mean, this is an example of our official basic UI. Um, then I show you the, the C-sharp UI, which looks similar, although the technology stack has been replaced completely. Of course, we introduced the, the ribbon, we introduced integrated BI, and this is an example of the universal UI. So this is on a high level our concept. And let's take a jump in time. Let's go to 2027, and we look back. What do we see? What is the effect of low-code? I mean, with low-code and no-code platforms, we build fast. We are productive. Business can join us. So we build apps. We will build apps on top 
of the core application on this, this picture besides the core applications. I think there are more, more connections between those apps in the core application than you see here. And by the way, this is a very simple landscape. There's only 100 apps. Normally, you have 1,000 or 2,000 apps or 5,000 apps. How are you going to manage that? It's getting very, very complex, especially if you change definitions, which are in maybe 500 apps. Then you have to go through them all. In Just 20 development platforms. In, ah, in 20 development platforms, <laughs> if you have more than one. So, so this is hard to do. But maybe most importantly is that the no-code and the low-code vendors didn't prove to migrate from one technology to another. So no-code and low-code platforms might be the legacy accelerator. And we had already such a big problem with legacy. So how big will this problem be? So I think this will be filled. This is filled in a couple of years. Five years, seven years, I don't know. But we will, we will add too many apps, and we cannot maintain it anymore. So what's the thinkwise approach? I've called it a flexible core. And everything you see here, we have available right now, today. So we have a business model where business analysts can create their model. We have a, an, a, an application model which can be built by for professional developers. We have an authorization model for the system integrator. We have user preference model where users can adjust their own screens and we can register how the system is being used. It's here. But the only change is made through the business. And that's a good thing, but maybe not enough. I'm not so fond on citizen development because I think it's hard to maintain, but I like their ideas. I would like to use their ideas. Users have good ideas. We can learn from them. So what if we make our platform available for certain developers? And they are allowed to add to the model, but we tag it, we tag it as experimental. They are not allowed to change the formal application model. That's for the professional developer. So they cannot uh, ruin our company, but they can add ideas. And if ideas are good enough, then we can pr promote, or then, then we can uh, move the experimental application model or part from it to the formal application model. So citizen developers can, 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 can implement their ideas in an integrated manner. And we can also analyze the usage. When we know how people work with the system, then software can basically learn from that and change itself. We can change the model by learning from the usage. I mean, if I start a system and I always start the customer screen and all the customers are, 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 have been lo are loaded and I, I start filtering because every time I, I want to filter for another client, customer, what, what, what can we learn from that? If I start the application, start the customer screen right away, don't load all the data, because Victor is always filtering. To load data doesn't make sense. Show the filter screen and only with the, with, the, with the name field, because the other fields he never uses. Just a few things to learn how the system is being used. So we can make software self-learning. And it's very easy to us, because we use runtime interpretation. So if we change the model, then the application is changed immediately. When you generate software from a model, then you have to generate, deploy, and, and your system is not self-learning. So we put that in from the beginning. And now we have a situation that your flexible core is flexible from three areas, from three points of views. From the business point of view, from your user point of view, and from the way the system is used. But still in an integrated manner. Another thing for the future. I mean, we have the upcycler maybe for 10 years. I think even more. And when we upcycle, we upcycle one application. It can be a huge application, but still one application. But we have learned that the application landscape of our clients and prospects will look like this, with a lot of apps, a lot of other applications. So I think we have to be a bit more ambitious and make the upcycler 
the landscape upcycler. So imagine we have, a, we have a piece of software or software plug and we plug it into your landscape. And what it does, it makes an analysis of your landscape. Basically, the same application of our pump manufacturer. Just describe your landscape. And we choose which applications we would like to upcycle. Not all of them. Keep your accounting, keep your salary, keep your HR. But I think 80% you must, must upcycle. And if you upcycle them, then you can integrate them. And you lose all those interfaces because it becomes one model. And for the few applications you cannot, uh, you cannot integrate, you need interfaces, but we can model them as well. We can optimize the model. Optimizing means also throwing away. Software you don't use, please throw away. And we can enrich the model, and for that we can also use our thing store. In our thing store are a lot of examples, a lot of submodels, a lot of aspect, aspect systems you can use in your model. So you, you can extend your landscape. And the result is the flexible core. So you go from the low-code effect to the thinkwise effect. So finally, some good news. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. Because I can't imagine, after all the cool presentations of today, of our partners, of our clients, of our, uh, our technical experts, I can't imagine you choose anything else than the flexible core. And we take care of your technological future. But maybe you work in an enterprise and they have a policy, say, so, yeah, we have off-shelf policy. Nobody knows why, but we have off-the-shelf policy. So you can't move to Thinkwise yet. Or maybe you have a CFO, he only knows SAP. So you can't really move to the Thinkwise core. But then you will end up in a core application with a lot of apps around it, and it's hard to manage. This, this, this will probably lead to chaos, and I think it's a dead end. But the good news is, we will have the landscape upcycler. So we can migrate you to the right track at any time. So I, I, I would like to send you home without any software worries any, anymore, because we are there to help you whenever you are ready. Thank you. Oh. You know, it's very special when you can actually look five years into the future. <laughs> so are there any questions in the audience? I can't imagine you don't have a question. Who dares? I have a question for you. You said that when you wrote the book and um, your expectations then and basically the situation that our, that, you know, our, our team built, they were exceeding your expectations. What do you expect here? Do you expect your ex expectations to be exceeded again or are you oh. spot on? Have you learned from the past 20 years? Now we are, yeah, of course, we are, we are very fast, but it is, that is so hard to, to predict. Um, because, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, we, right now we, we retain Universal with surface tear. That takes some more time than we thought. Uh, in, often, in other cases, we are faster. It depends a lot of the choices we make. I mean, 10 years ago, we made a choice to build a Java user interface that was good for a couple of our clients. Um, but in the end, we didn't use it a lot. So to, to know which main technology will be your next techn technology, technology plug, that's a real challenge. And that's really hard to, uh, or hard, that is a decision we should take very carefully. And I think that decision is more influencing if we are um, exceeding expectations or not. Okay, that's a very diplomatic answer. They were not accepting, so. <laughs> Yes or no? Exceeding or not exceeding? <laughs> yeah, then I hope, uh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> of course, exceeding. <laughs> Pressure. Any questions? If not, then we'll move to our final 
almost our final part. Uh, Victor, please help me here. Um, once again, basically, Victor Klare, ladies and gentlemen. All right, thank you.